Welcome back, everybody, to another podcast on the Hiccup coming to you, not so live, yeah. but almost live from the Financial Planning Association Conference Congress, I should say, here in Sydney. Uh, it's the largest mini series ever, isn't it? We're day two and we've just ticked series. over lunch, and there's about to be some hungry people join us as well. I feel like we had day one and day two. We should have had season one and season two, <laughs> like on Netflix. We might do that later. That's a good idea. Now, we are joined by the CEOs, plural, mm. of the current associations, the Financial Planning Association and the Association of Financial Advisors. Welcome, Sarah. Welcome, Phil. Hi, Fraser. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, hi Fraser. Excellent to be here. And we are going to kick off talking about the Congress itself. Sarah, this is over to you. Tell us, uh, you must be very proud. Well, we're just so excited. The mood is fantastic. I think having so many people together in person after so long, everyone is saying how great it feels to be together again. And there's 1,200 people here. So it's an atmosphere that you certainly can't replicate on Zoom. The content has been really well received. I think people are just enjoying that ability to to get back out there, get back out and network with colleagues and see the latest thinking from around the world as well as in Australia. So the mood's fantastic. I'm just so happy at how it's going. And it's your 30th birthday for the FPA Congress as well. So there's going to be some cupcakes at some stage, I've heard. Yep, yep. That's the important cupcakes. thing. That's what, I, that's, that's what I've been trying to track down cupcakes today. Cupcakes and gin. I mean, well, what a gin I tested last yeah. night and that was delicious. <laughs> I can give that a rave review. Thank you, Four Pillars. <laughs> That was fantastic. And um, I, I think that, that uh, Christmas feeling is in the air mm, as well. Isn't it? I think people are feeling like, okay, we've had a long, hard three years. It's a bit of a dawn of a new era. Up, we've yeah. run the marathon and the future is looking bright. And that sense of optimism about the future is really coming through. Yeah, we've absolutely heard that in the podcasts that we've been having in the chats that we've been having with people who've been presenting or the advisors. Everyone is really excited and they're sort of talking about really robust businesses uh, that perhaps there's been that grind, but they're, stu- they're already doing well. Yeah. It's not even they're going to start doing well. There's a lot of success that they're talking about that's already happened. So it's fantastic to see that and hear that. The hustle and bustle has certainly been around and for people listening to podcasts, uh, all the, the the original podcasts that we've been doing uh, the last couple of days, there's been a lot of noise in the background and there's, there's been a real buzz in the air. Um, now, one of the sessions that were, has been you know, anticipated and a lot of people attended was the session around the, com- the conversation around bringing the two associations together. It's been a hot topic um, uh, for many sessions over the last few months and uh, you know, since it was announced. Uh, Phil, we'll go to you. Tell us a little bit about um, the, the conversation, how it's been going. Obviously, there's been a fair bit of feedback over that time. Yeah, so the first announcement was the 1st of September. That's when we went to the market with the... Uh, yeah, explanation that we're exploring the the prospect of a merger and there's been a lot of consultation since then you know we've had individual webinars we've had a joint webinar where Sarah and myself were involved we had the FPA board come to the AFA conference a couple of months ago and and this time around we've got the AFA board come to the FPA congress Uh, and so the the discussion the dialogue has been ongoing and you know we've had a lot of opportunities to interact with people. This morning was another opportunity with uh, both the chair of the FPA and the president of the AFA on the stage and answering questions. And look, it it was a decent turn up. There was, I think, was about 60 people there and they were engaged. You know, they were were wanting to ask questions and understand the priorities of the new organisation, assuming that members uh, approve uh, the merger, which we're scheduling uh, a vote at the end of February next year, and uh, there was positivity about it, and, a, a, and a, a commitment to do it. I think so. There's a lot of work to be done. We still need to get this to a stage where we've got the documentation that's required to consult with members, and then ultimately put it to a vote. Um, but we're we're hearing positive feedback. Yep. And Sarah, what have been some of the main themes you're hearing within that feedback? Yeah, so a lot of the questions from our members have been around the uh, new constitution and the new name, and and that's really important because it is partly symbolic of the two organisations coming together, but it's also acknowledging that it will be a new association. So that the the importance of, of what the name of the association is keeps coming up, and it keeps being one of the first couple of questions that we get, and that's going to be an important part of the member consultation. Because this is the association of its members and it's really important that members feel that the name, the constitution, the way that we present ourselves to the world and the objects and the goals that we have 
are theirs because we exist for our members. So that consultation that Phil was referring to will include an ability for members to let us know what's important to them about the name. And, and if they've got a name, <laughs> I've had heaps of suggestions. A, uh, what's your least favourite name? No, don't <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 there's a lot, um, and we are keeping a, a name bank, if you like. Mm. Wasn't, wasn't there a risk? That, didn't they do that with one of the boats that they uh, no. launched in the UK when it was Boaty McBoat? <laughs> we're not we're calling not, it Boaty McBoat. Okay, it's not association. <laughs> I think it was a ferry. Face. I think it was Ferry yeah. McFerry face. Oh, was it? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, no, I think we. the, the importance is recognised and we're engaging some experts to help us through this process so they know what they're doing we're not going to come up with very much very face we right. are going to come up with something that so member, is meaningful member members. consultation means serious conversation yeah. not just a, a vote for a silly name so in member consultation that's been done to date and the sentiment that you've heard what are those really important things that this new association needs to reflect for its members like what are the things you can go look that's really important there's a lot to yeah. be clarified yet but what are the things you, you, you know you've got to do well I'll chat to the ones mm. that are raised with me and then maybe Phil, you can you can talk to the ones that AFA members are, are speaking on. So for FPA members, the CFP designation is incredibly important. Uh, many of them have put a lot of time and effort and money into gaining that designation, and they want to ensure that it continues to be supported. It continues to lead, and that's that will be the case. And it's important for us to demonstrate that. And and the commitment to professionalism, the commitment to high standards is incredibly important to our members as well. And they need to see that that is going to continue in the new association. The other kind of linking one, I guess, is that we, we both get questions about fees and, and will the cost of membership change? And the work that we're doing at the moment um, is, is in our view. And from what we've seen, that there won't be a membership category that pays more in the new association that's pretty important to people in these days of high inflation as well. Yeah, to to add to that, uh, I think everyone's on the same page about advocacy being a a priority going forward and I don't think we've got substantial differences there. Um, You've seen that this week with us having consistent views about life insurance commissions. Um, I I think the, the feedback from our members is probably in the field of making sure that the community um, is maintained and that sense of belonging to an organisation. And that's not something that, in my view, is is an obstacle. It's just about framing how we move forward to make sure that we hold on to the best things uh, of each association as we move forward. Professional designations is is equally important for some of our members... um, it's recognised that the FCHFP and the Chartered Life Practitioner won't be ongoing in terms of open programs, but we're holding on to those professional designations and we will continue um, to recognise and promote them so that the value is preserved in them. I think another thing that's come back from our members is about representation and having that sense that there is someone involved at the senior level of the association that is representing them um, and putting their advocating for the the views and the issues that are are local in a in a um, uh, in a broader context so that's that's important i think more generally people are just wanting to get on with this and and make it happen and uh it's an it's a process that you need to work through now there's lawyers involved and there's documentation but i think ultimately uh it comes to a vote and then we make it happen if our members approve it. Tell, tell us about that voting process, because it's quite important that I think people know about it. Yeah, so the, the plan at the moment is that we'll have uh, two EGMs, Extraordinary General Meetings, one for the uh, FPA, one for the AFA. Both of our organisations, I think we have the mechanism for members to vote via proxy. So if we have the meeting at the end of February next year, then we've got to get the documentation out to members uh, at least 21 days before that. We'll be doing this in a hybrid sense, so there'll be the ability for people to come face-to-face, but there'll also be the ability for people to participate um, remotely. And then uh, in terms of proxy votes, once the papers go out, we'll both be doing this in terms of platforms where it's possible to make your vote and you can make that vote uh, at any stage in advance of the meeting. You just have to nominate 
who you want to be your proxy and you've got the chance to um, to make the, the votes recorded. Yep. And and talk to me about the, the level, Sarah, of uh, you need 75%. Yes, that's right. So it's just a Corpse Act thing. Of the members who vote, 75% need to vote in favour. But I think we, we both feel very strongly that we'd want to see a really high proportion of our membership voting as well. So we're really keen for people to vote. Um, I think there's a bit of a sense among some members that it's a kind of, oh, well, you know, just get on with it, of course. Yeah, that'll go ahead. But we do need members to indicate their approval. I think we're both keen for there to be a mandate. And that means a really high proportion of our members voting as well. And that's what we're hoping for. We really want members to ensure that they, they do make sure their voice is heard and that their vote's recorded. So yep. don't sit on the sidelines. Absolutely not. Yeah, yes. Don't be quiet on this matter. That's the call to action, isn't it? If, uh, if, you, don't, if you don't vote because you make the assumption, then you could, uh, yeah, you could end right. up affecting the outcome. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's, it's an important point because the more people vote, the more reflective it is of the views of the broader membership base. If it's a small number of people that vote, then it could be influenced by... Um, smaller groups, and we want it to be representative of the of the full membership base. Yeah, fantastic. And and if, if, what's the process after that? Um, for if, if the if it all comes together, what sort of a timeline are we looking at? So the the transition, there's a number of things that need to happen after the vote. So we can, we don't just wake up the next morning and, and we're the new association. So there's a governance transition when the, in the boards coming together and the way that they do that the constitution is adopted and then of course all the rules and regs and so on that are associated with that constitution need to be updated and and published. Also importantly, membership has got to be resolved and the new association will be offering membership clearly to the members of both associations and because at the moment the AFA has a monthly rolling membership, but the FPA has an annual membership. So we need to get that aligned for members of both associations on that financial year basis. So that'll be a really early focus. It's making sure that everyone understands, okay, I was member type A in the in the previous association, now I'm member type B. I've got to log into the portal and, and upgrade it and hit the button to say, yes, this is my member type. So there'll be a lot of communication and and uh, information coming out around that membership transition as well. And then once that that process is complete, then we complete the merger with the AFA finishing off the last the last few issues with some of those um, legal structures, corporation pieces yeah. and so on. And then we consider the transition to be complete. It's likely to take some months after the end of the financial year, but in terms of members, the goal is... Everyone knows where they stand. Everyone's member of the new association by the end of the financial year. Yeah, it's a really good point you raised. There was a lot of work to do in that background with the different structures, and a lot yeah. of people probably don't realise how much structure is behind the scenes. For example, whether it's the, um, the, the the charitable foundation pieces or the um, or the or, or the other organisations that look at managing the money behind the scenes. So yeah, there is a lot lot to do. Yeah, that's right. We we've got. Um, the AFA, the association itself. We've got the AFA Foundation, which is our charitable entity, which the AFA is the trustee of. And then we have the AFA Investment Fund, which is uh, is our reserves, um, our rainy day fund, which has its own uh, trustee, corporate trustee with its own board. So there's all of those things that, that have to take place, but ultimately... We want to ensure that all of these entities are included in this. The the um, the, the documentation that comes out from early to, to mid December will will go through this process in more detail. There'll be an information memorandum, and it'll talk to when the legal completion date is and the other steps that need to take place. Yeah, so it's a very fairly serious voting to be had uh, as we go through that process and, and I wish you all the best through that process. I know that there'll, there'll be a lot of work done uh, to, to get that through. Uh, Sarah, I want to finish by saying thank you so much for having us along uh, to the to the Congress. It's been, uh, like we said, the buzz you can, in the background is amazing and uh, you must be so proud of what's, uh, what's, what's happened here. Thanks so much, Fraser. I think this is a fantastic idea to do the podcast. It's, I've really enjoyed the couple I've done and I think it's a, it's a fabulous way to get the message out to people who weren't able to make it this year. Really hoping they can join us next year and, and thank you for all your support. It's been yeah, great. Danny and I haven't been able to get to a lot of the sessions because we've been here, but we got the short version of most yeah. of the sessions. 
<laughs> we've been able to spread the ideas. We've got the highlights for you, so we've had a great time. Fantastic. Thank you. And thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Welcome back to our series from, brought to you from the Financial Planning Association Conference in Sydney. I'm joined with Conrad Travis. Thank you for joining me, Conrad. Great to be here. Now, you are from a business called Tangelo Consulting. Yeah, Tangelo Advice Consulting. That's correct. Yep. Yeah, tell us a little bit about the business. So, we set up about three or four years ago. We've got a team of about five people who've all come out of the, the corporate advice world. Um, and we're compliance consultants. So, we support licensees B2B uh, around identifying their gaps. So, that could be people, policy, process and governance. And then kind of rolling our sleeves up and closing those gaps. So it's really a practical compliance service to support licensees with what, what they need. Yeah, fantastic. And, you're, and, and licensees are the people that you're working with directly? Yeah, licensees and wealth businesses because there's a few wealth businesses trying to get into advice. So we're, we're supporting both. Yep. yep, fantastic. And if people wanted to, to find somebody, how would they reach out to, uh, to you? Yeah, so tangeloconsulting.com.au. Uh, we're also available on, on LinkedIn and you know, happy to take a phone call anytime. Yeah, fantastic. Now, you ran a session uh, yes. or your team ran a session. Tell us a little, a little bit about the session that, you, that you've just come off stage from? Yeah, so we ran a session called Controlling the Controllables and looking at um, some practical tips around compliance. So we looked at it through a few different lenses. The first one, which is kind of interesting, is that um, in the last few years, we've found every single licensee that we know, even though we're focused on compliance, has people issues. So one of the things we say before we start with anything is, have you got the right people? Have they got role mandates in place? Do you do training? Do they understand why they're doing that? So we kind of covered that off first and there was a lot of questions about that and some of the um, attendees were talking about different things that had worked for them. And then we talked about process. So this is about um, you know, having a process document for everything that you do, trying to automate that as much as possible, so, so trying to take risk off the table. And then we, we had a long conversation about ongoing service and fixed term agreements as well as um, file construction, so how a file can tell a story. So that's one of the main points, Fraser, that just coming out of the session is Advisors are great at talking uh, to clients, but really bad at documenting it. So when uh, compliance people look at their file, they don't understand why they've recommended what they've recommended. So our number one tip would be, make sure when you're looking at your fact find, your SOA, your file note, that the whole thing works together as a story. So someone who didn't even know about advice could pick it up and go, I know why you've done what you've done. Yeah, it's a really interesting part. And we've done some conversations around the video statement of advice and and being able to then... uh, Say and 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 some of the tips that came out of that were, were advisors are very good at saying or speaking the advice and yes. terrible at writing what. Yeah, actually like happened. you sort of ask them like, why did you do that? And they talk about it with passion about, oh, that client was you know an older client with dementia, so that's what. But then you don't see that on the file, so yeah. that's really what we're trying, the, trying to say. The disconnect now, uh, compliance session, but a very interactive compliance session. Yes. Um, let's go back to the beginning, the 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 cultural, the people part of it. What sort of uh, were the tips and highlights around that that piece? Yeah, so the first thing is, um, have you got role mandates in place? Uh, the second one would be, have you got regular training in place? And one of the practical tips that we gave there was to have a lunch session every two weeks on uh, financial advice strategies, but to actually explain to the support staff why they've done what they've done. So we often find when we come into a practice, after they've sort of trusted us, the support staff will talk to us and go, I don't know what's going on or why I'm doing this. So it's that old story of like until you explain the why, they won't understand, what, you know, like the efficiency of what they're doing. Yeah, that's the key to the culture of any business, isn't it? To have Absolutely. people come along on the journey, the, the, the passion, the purpose, but understanding why why things are you're doing it, but also why strategies and, what, and how those, like when you get into the interactive of certain strategies and understanding within a fire why something's been done, uh, that everybody knows the benefit of those strategies. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And so uh, people were the first part, then you talk about process. So process, so again, process maps, um, and it's not that hard, you know, just jump in a room with a whiteboard and talk about, like, what do we, what do, we do for new clients? What are all the different steps involved in that? Uh, for a review meeting, who needs to be involved in the different steps of getting the client to come in, the follow-up, the product fulfillment component? And then putting that on a page and having everyone own and understand that. But then looking at via your CRM what you can do with workflows and automation to make sure that you, you kind of take risk off the table. So we, we asked the question in the room, how many people of you have done a, a process document? About half had done it. Um, but we said having something is better than nothing. So let's start on that journey so that you're actually also de-risking your practice. So if anyone gets uh, hit by a bus, you're in a much better position. Now, I want to ask you about where this lives because it's great to do it on a whiteboard. 
uh, and then you you know or, you know or get the post notes out and put little lines yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and have a bit of fun with it. But then when you do put that into a document, and, and how do you then uh, like keep that and so that you can recall it and everyone can see it? What, what are you suggesting, that Spence? Yeah, like we've got um, clients who use Lucidchart, which is like sort of a, a way to take the from the whiteboard into an electronic version. So I would say yeah, that could be a good tool that you could use to go. These are the different steps and who who owns at the different layers. But then beyond that, you probably want to look at an operating procedure that actually builds that out into more depth to say, what do those steps mean? So I'm not talking about a 15-page document, but something five or six pages that actually says, this is the step involved in that component. And then on the back of that, you can do some really good training with um, with staff so they can understand exactly what your expectations are around that process. Yep. Yeah. yeah, now, now easy, easy to say when you love, can, when you love written documents. Um, some advisors might not, but I think that there is certainly a way that they can do that with regards to just recording a yes. conversation around what are the six points they need to make around that lucid chart or that visual. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, whatever works for you. But look, the main point is do something. Like if you're in a place where you're using X plan, but you're, some of your files are saved on your My Docs, this is what you picked up in your cyber piece, right? Yep. And you're using your email and you're kind of bumbling along. Just take it to the next level about the things that you can control to, to just lift the bar a little bit. Not saying go over and beyond, like from a compliance perspective, but just continual improvement. Yeah, and then let's let's get into the. Or was there anything else on process? No, no, that was all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And tell us about the third part. So ongoing service. Um, so we talked a lot about that. There's a lot of questions. So there's a couple of components there. Firstly, make sure staff understand why it's really important. The second one is um, when you have a contractual arrangement with a client, try and limit it to like one or two services yeah. that you can actually show evidence of delivery of from a contractual perspective. If you have a whole lot of services that you deliver beyond that, put it in your marketing information, but don't sign up for that. And then make sure that your CRM proves delivery of those services within that 12-month period. It's interesting, isn't it, because it got really vague, didn't it? It was the, the, Let's just make it one thing and make it vague. Yeah, exactly. And have you seen that come back to bite practices? Uh, yeah, well, and, and this is the thing. that What ASIC is saying is that the review is the main service. So don't feel like you're not adding that much value if you've only got two services in that contract. Because the the client is going to see the advisor as the the main point of contact and, and and the value of that relationship. What it says in the contract isn't that important, but from a remediation perspective, it's really important. And it's really important that when they have those interactions with clients and the review, that that's really well documented on their CRM. And a really practical tip is a lot of them have access to your advisor as one of the services. And what we would say is don't just rely on your 1-800 number actually have a contact in the CRM to say, I, I called this client and that provided, um, ticked off that requirement, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay, so so um, yeah, good good, good, good point. Access to uh, advisor, I think <coughs> you would, would see that a lot. Um, how, how, what other things in there that you think that we should be very careful of? Yeah, well, the other thing is around um, fee disclosure statements. Uh, I know it's probably getting a bit technical here, yeah. but we, we found with, there's a report called RG636 where they went through the mid-tiers. They found 75% non, non-compliance. So this is a document that everyone's getting wrong, and the main reason is, like, one, GST and the way that um, the platforms treat that versus how we, we think of GST. And the second one is how revenue is produced from the revenue... Um, companies that feed into x or whatever your CRM system is. Yep. So our main advice there is to make sure your FDSs are accurate and correct to the actual fees charged by the client, allowing for timing differences. So if, for example, the fee comes out at the 13th of the following month, you want to be really careful if you're producing that report on the 30th of June to make sure that the, the FDS is accurate. So I know that's really kind of in the weeds, but it's really important. It, it is a big point. It's, it's a difficult one, though. It is. It is. So some licensees, and I know this isn't great, but they'll go back to the fund manager record and go to the actual transaction before the document goes out to make sure it's correct. Yeah, that's a, that seems like, uh, again, from a process point of view, it's 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 a long process uh, and very difficult. To, and tell us a little bit about the, the, the engagement in the in the session that you had, because I know a lot of people got involved and wanted to share things. Yeah, look, we need to think of a better name than compliance, because as soon as you say compliance, like advisors look at their shoes. But really what we're thinking about is actually advice process and how to make you more effective and efficient. And so there's a lot of things that advisors can control right now that they're feeling just overwhelmed and fatigued about. So one is your attitude. So if you get an order and you don't like the outcome, there's a lot of like angst around that. So just thinking about flipping that from a growth mindset perspective and going, like, what could we learn from this? How can we improve our systems and processes? That's what the best practices are doing. The, the lowest performing practices are the ones that are getting like just lost in the mud of 
I hate compliance, I hate Hain, I hate the regulators. And they're not wrong, but they're also, it's not going to help them um, deliver a great service for their clients, if that makes sense. Yeah, there's certainly a logical process with, a, with an audit, and then there's an emotional piece, isn't there? Correct, about, correct. Uh, nobody exactly. likes to get a uh, bad marks, or nobody likes to get, uh, um, you know, told that they're, they're not doing what they should be doing. It's kind of like a, a fear that comes across people. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But we need to break down the us and them component of that and actually just talk about, okay, on the back of the QAR, we've got a really good opportunity here to reduce the paperwork and focus on the so what. So it's quite interesting that AFCA say that when they review SOAs, they can't actually find the advice. Isn't that fascinating? So, so I think on the back of the QAR and, and Michelle Levy saying, over to you, you determine how you want to document your advice. That is an unbelievable opportunity for us to go... This is how we want to document that, whether it's a video SOA, whether it's a six-page summary, um, to say, basically, what are you recommending, why are you recommending it, and what are the next steps? That's yeah. what we need to really cover off. And all the other information, the analysis that you've done can sit on file, um, but that's a bit of a game changer if people get their head around that. I think all of those things are still valuable to the conversation. Absolutely. The clients want to actually know that information and, yeah. and to be able to uh, you say that or put that in a, in a I like to think of the idea that one day we'll actually have financial plans not statements of advice absolutely um, that's my mission to try and get that and uh, my other mission is to try and change good advice to professional advice um, those it. are my those are my tips hey Conrad thanks so much for coming in and chatting with us today sounds like your session was amazing no uh, problem the feedback was really good so, great yeah, to see you Fraser appreciate it take care mate good afternoon everyone we are back on air Still here. I feel like we're on the home stretch. We are on the home stretch, and we're 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 trying to find some sort of drink to keep us going. <laughs> no, these conversations are actually really exciting. So that's the energy that we need. Welcome back, everyone. Hello, Fraser. Hello. Thanks for sticking with me. Oh, oh I'm here. What episode is this in the uh, in the mini uh, longest mini series ever? No, I don't know. Thirty. Well, we everyone, you'll be excited to know that we have Ben Donald. Hello, Joining everybody. Us. Yes, and I don't have a drink with me. I'm sorry. Yeah, you were supposed to bring a drink, Ben. It was the bribe that I got to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Ben. Now, you have been doing some really important work um, on behalf of the FPA to, atta- uh, to address the talent gap that mm-hmm. everyone is aware of yep. who is in advice. Before we get to what you've been speaking today at the FPA Congress on, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Because you're a bit of a big cheese. <laughs> That's a technical maybe, technique. yeah. Well, maybe for a, a, but a mouse or two. Maybe <laughs> how good? Uh, is, how good a question is that? Yeah, well, it's, it's, um, it's quite intimidating. All right, yeah. so everybody, my name's Harvey Specter, and uh, I'm the best. No, Ben, uh, ben Big Cheese Donald. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll just stick with Ben for now. Okay, Thank you, ben. everybody. Um, so, I work at a company called Osbrokers Life. We are a specialist life insurance group. Um, in fact, just last week, we cracked a big number. It's kind of horrible, but kind of great at the same time. We got $7 million worth of claims paid in one week. Wow. Um, so we have advisors all over the country. Uh, last financial year, I think we did $37 million in claims. And we partnered with a lot of financial planners who don't want to do risk. Um, and it's a two-way street, obviously, for looking after the client. I've been in the industry for maybe 13, 14 years and, to be honest, quite jealous of the professional year program that uh, has been instituted by the FPA and by the industry as a whole because I remember my first client meeting and cringe every single time. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a great memory. Yeah, yeah it's that I, awkward growing phase I and just, now has got a little bit of structure and training and help and a lot of... Uh, hours training uh, yeah but I think yeah. as you said that Ben every single person listening to this podcast oh, yeah. cringed at the same yeah, time as you um, <laughs> it's not oh, so at the session that we just did I actually pointed to to the lady that uh, sat next to me during that meeting and she had a good laugh because it was so bad that she actually remembers it as well yeah. so um, <laughs> yeah. if that client is out there I'm really sorry yeah. <laughs> isn't that a fantastic no but I think that's really important to point out because I think as an advisor in a relationship you're always hyper aware of being the expert Hmm. But that's very unnatural. There's a learning yeah. period and, and we have to be a bit more comfortable, I think, of making mistakes and saying silly things yeah. and asking the question in, yeah. in good intentions because that's all part of growing and learning and developing. And I think sometimes we're also afraid of saying, I just don't understand that term I should yeah, or I, I don't, don't know, know that or can I ask this question? Yeah. And so this professional year program and, 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 and year that an um, advisor would spend doing that is such an amazing opportunity to just that permission to be the person who's learning and growing yeah, and to, developing. to make mistakes, to ask questions, to, as you say, to say that, hey, I don't know what I'm doing here. Can you please help me? And I think reflecting on my own experiences coming into the industry, I really, really, really would have appreciated that because I went from 
being um, the assistant or the client service manager, filling out the paperwork and all that sort of thing and sitting in on those meetings but not really part, partaking in those meetings. Mm. Um, I was introduced, so, you know, this is Ben who'll be assisting us, but that was the limitation of my engagement. And then, you know, fast forward a year, um, it was right, oh, Ben, there's the door, go walk through it, the client's in there. And um, it really was sink or swim. Um, and I think I was resuscitated for about four times in the first yeah. six months, um, but it's worked out in the end. And so yeah. now you're going to go through the professional year, sounds like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll tell you what, the guy sitting next to me, uh, Michael, he's 26 years old and he looks nothing or behaves nothing like I did as a 26-year-old. I still struggle today. So, yeah, yeah I think the level of professionalism that's coming from the professional year program is um, it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And what is the FPA doing to support that year? So uh, the FBA is hosting quite a few events. So, so on the, I guess, the PR or the marketing front, they're, um, they're engaging with universities. Um, I think that might be extended into high schools very shortly, looking to grow the, uh, the perception and the awareness of our industry because obviously historically we haven't had the greatest reputation and that's all sort of turning around. We haven't now, been very wonderful. loud about it. That's the thing. Well, like, like, yeah. yeah, the other people have been allowed about us not yes, being correct. the greatest, where my view and everything that I'm trying to push with my current sort of output into the market is that I think everybody listening who's a financial advisor, you just sort of need to look in the mirror, lift your chin a few inches and realize that we are absolute rock stars. Um, there's never been a better time to enter into the industry and uh, the FPA are facilitating that really, really well. So they've got the PY program, which obviously goes for the year or however long it takes for an individual to complete it. Um, and they facilitate a lot of the training. Oh, sorry, they, they put a, a structure and a framework around that training. They've got bits of technology that you as an advisor can use and, and tap into, which makes everything really easy. To record um, that training and keep a track of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, because you know the last thing you want to do as an advisor is more paperwork. And a lot of advisors out there might think now that bringing on a PY is more paperwork. Mm. Um, the FBA and a few other organisations have seen that that's the case. So they're doing everything they can to get in front of that. So the, the tech already exists to help with bringing on uh, a PY. And the message that I would sort of send to a lot of the advisors would be that investing in a PY is a sorry in a, in a person who's completing their PY yeah. is actually a really good investment because no matter what happens, the person who's walking in the door is somebody who's trying to grow their career, trying to improve, and so will be paying much more attention to the processes and the strategies and the engagement with the client than than your average person, and they'll be doing everything they can to improve themselves. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And look, I think when the professional year was announced, there was a lot of questions. There was probably not as much support because it does take some time to understand where the mm. support is best placed. And you're talking about, you know, tools that can, can manage and keep track of the training. I know at XY, we're partnered with CFS and we've got a space where PY, um, I guess, what are, yeah, participants, candidates, candidates yeah, or they're yeah. going through a year. They're going through the professional year. So they could be an associate advisor doing that. Um, they can then talk with other people who are experiencing that same thing and ask questions oh, in that safe space. Yeah, building like a peer group. Exactly. At that level. So yeah. uh, there's, again, like all of these things, they're industry challenges and we can all chip in to, to make sure that that journey for someone starting out who we're all very keen to have more people start out in that journey is seamless mm. and so I think those spaces where there's live events that are obviously providing that sort of community one-on-one -on -one in person and then you can yeah. kind of walk away from that and also if you are an employer of someone through professional year I think there's a bit of a myth that it's a huge burden mm. and perhaps it was when when the when you know that that whole professional year kicked off, but there are, certainly are like we've got the CFS tech team inside XY ask like answering questions not only for PYs mm. but also the employers of yeah, PY right. yeah. pretending to be there. Yeah, <laughs> the no, no, it's, it's no, a no, space no, for I questions. Yeah, 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 space for questions. So there's Somebody's plenty of support. So I, I would say that yeah, your, your comments there, Ben, around saying to practitioners who've got those firms mm. and to encourage someone to go through that year. Yeah, so the and infrastructure, it's, it's taken, it's, you know, it's leaps and bounds that it's grown on to make it easier and easier. And I think now there's a, a thousand uh, students registered with the FPA at the moment. So yeah, the numbers awesome. are starting to increase. But um, just what you mentioned before about having a peer group, um, again, that's one of the things that I would have valued out of sight if, if I'd had that coming through. So that's mm. that's a brilliant initiative. Yeah, it's one of the things I set up originally when I was a young young advisor. We set up a peer group and we had a young advisors club. It was, it was really great. Yeah, hey, well, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that is in the back of somebody's mind when they're employing a, a PY is around, and it's the same whether they're employing apprentices in a different type of business, yep. is that 
um, you're training people up and you really want those people to stay. And so I think there's a, you know, there could be a bit of a scenario where there's a hot demand for newly qualified people to come into yep. practices. Uh, what are your thoughts around this? Yeah, so you, you can't deny that there's a lot of our large institutions that are offering large amounts of money. Um, and I think the way that you sort of demonstrate your value back to the professional year individual is um, build a culture with them, build a rapport because you've got a year basically uh, at, at a minimum you've got a year to build a, a level of connection and engagement with the individual that would make them want to stay on and if they're if they're learning from you at that pace they're getting exposure to clients you're having open and honest conversations about that individual's growth about their contributions shortcomings whatever it might be then I think invariably those people are want to go, are going to want to stay on with you mm-hmm. um, and even if you go like let's let's go the worst scenario where you put in all this effort into an individual and they, then they you know after twelve months or whatever they they want to go somewhere else again I just go back to the fact that the person who's in your company is an individual who is self motivated and um, they're not rare but they're they're not the most common people those, those individuals that actually want to strive to grow they want to improve themselves so they're paying much more attention um, and they're making that extra effort and. What you'll find as an advisor, let's say in the first couple of weeks, you teach them how to fill out a certain type of form. Um, You'll find that if you or somebody else had to do that form, in a couple of weeks' time, you won't. So the return on investment in having that person come through the ranks um, and and almost be like your assistant is, uh, is something that pays off really, really quickly. I think it's a really good point that, you, well, you just you made a something that clicked in my head. If you take on someone who's in that professional year stage, You've actually got a, a whole year probably. You're more likely to have that person for a mm. full year and be able to invest in their development and also build that build that rapport. And it's interesting when we speak or people tend to say, look, I've moved on or I wasn't happy or an advisor will say, like, made all this investment into yeah. someone and they just left. Yes, that does happen. But a lot of times the second question, well, well did you have that employ- employee value proposition? Yeah. And then the, the answer is no. Yeah. And the open and honest, transparent conversations are so important because they are ambitious and they, they kind of need a reason to stay. And if you're not yeah. having those conversations and there's no expectations or you're promising things, I think the biggest piece of feedback when we were talking to professional year people was that I was promised this stuff that didn't actually eventuate but there was no conversation around – maybe it made sense that it didn't eventuate but it just wasn't spoken about. So all the promises – then I started, yep. nothing came to fruition and I was kind of just left thinking, well, why would I, would I, would I trust I this employee, mm. yep. employer relationship, which yep. is I don't want to invest into it because it yep. just I was told things that didn't eventuate. So I think that conversation is really important and not over-inflating what you can offer someone. Mm. I, think, I think there's another thing to, to that too and that, that, that we've all been around now for a number of years within the, within the profession. Some more than others, for and, sure. And, but, you know, like you might work I've with somebody. I've been around for a very small might, amount of time. You work with somebody and then you work with them again somewhere else. You know what mm. I mean? Like, I mean, you're, you're mentoring them into a position and, and if, even if they do leave, they might be leaving to get this experience somewhere else. But then yeah. later on, you might find yourselves uh, coming back together. Yeah. I think as an advisor, if you... You know, you talk about the value proposition, right? So we've all we all try to relay that back to our clients in terms of a client value proposition. I think you've got to do the same sort of thing as an employer as well. What the value proposition is you bring to a young person wanting to come in, um, but be honest with yourself in terms of what you're promising them. But then, as an advisor, look to the resources around you. So the FPA's got a great program. Um, you know, XY's obviously got a great program as well. Working with CFS, there are lots of institutions in there and. Pretty much every stakeholder in the industry at the moment is looking for ways to improve the supply of advice. So as an advisor, reach out to your peers and find out what they can do to help and, and provide support in that area. Because what are the figures that we need? I mean, I've heard a lot of figures thrown out there, but 2,000 advisors is what we need as an industry to replace the current need in, in firms that are looking to recruit another advisor. Yeah, it's, I Two to so. 3,000, it, it fluctuates between yeah. that, but it's a huge number, right? Yeah. Everyone needs, um, there's no... That's just a catch up to where we should be before yeah, exactly. we start uh, getting Growth. to Yeah, I think yeah. we were 30,000 at one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah crazy. Hey, uh, thanks so much for coming on and chatting us with the, with the podcast and about the, P- the PYE. Really appreciate you coming in and sharing what happened in your session today. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Enjoy. Ben. Catch up.